Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm back from Essen 2018 and plugged in the mic, so that's always a positive. Ah, oh well. First day back. Well, okay, technically got back late Monday night. Uh, took yesterday and slept most of the day, and now I'm back. And so here we go, all right? Uh, so Spiel, for those that don't know, Spiel 2018, or Essen, as a lot of us are want to call it, uh, is kind of board game mecca for, at least for me and for heavy cardboard, because the haul that we have brought back this year is going to be the majority of the new games that we're going to cover over the next calendar year. Now, that's not to say that we're not going to cover older games, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We absolutely are. There's going to be arguably more older games than new games that get covered, but it's still Essen. And it was essentially six days of 18-hour days of work and fun all rolled into one. So the uh, spiel ran from Thursday morning until Sunday night. But for those of us that are in the industry, it essentially started Tuesday, either afternoon, basically Tuesday afternoon, which is kind of the first setup day. Then Wednesday is the big setup day, and then the spiel itself begins Thursday and runs from 10 a.m. The doors open at 10 a.m. and go until 7 p.m. each day, except for Sunday, which it goes from 10 a.m. to 7 or to 6 p.m. However, for those of us that are either uh, exhibitors can come in real, real early. Um, the press can get in. I think it's half an hour early. We were fortunate enough to also have exhibitor badges, so we were able to come in as early as 8 a. <coughs> excuse me, 8 a.m. And basically, the days went. If you listen to the daily diaries, the days went till a lot of times till about two in the morning uh, when I would record the daily diaries to be uploaded back here in the states for you guys to listen to. So. On that note, if you haven't heard the Daily Diaries from Spiel and you would like to kind of get a in-the-moment living, how it's going feel, I would suggest going to heavycardboard.com and checking out the podcast feed or the Heavy Cardboard supplemental feed, which is where all the Daily Diaries get posted. Whew. So, I'm going to kind of double this as an Ask the Elephant as well as a, it's not really going to be an unboxing, it's just going to show off a bunch of the games. And the games that I have here on the table and on the chair next to me are just the games that we physically muled back in two uh, check bags and our two carry-ons and our backpacks. So that's what we, Jess and I, had to carry all this stuff back. I learned how to nest games very, very well. And to be honest with you, I think there's really only one box out of all of these that really got banged up pretty well, which considering, I'll take it. Also should uh, let you guys know that there are going to be a total of three more boxes coming. There are two 30 kilo boxes, and I do mean 30 kilo, like to the ounce, or I guess to the gram, maybe. Uh, so there's 60 kilos that I shipped from Spiel itself, and then there are another 14 kilo box that we shipped the morning we left that wasn't going to fit in everything. So I have three more boxes that are going to be coming. Uh, and we had two overweight bags. So here's a little piece of advice that each of our overweight bags for our check bags cost 75 euros in addition to paying for the baggage fee that you know you have in most flights. So it costs essentially 150 euros to mule everything that you see today, which given the number of games, I imagine this is going to be on the higher end of what your average person who drives is going to bring with them. So for 150 euros to mule home, and I, I feel like that's, that's money well spent. All right, so enough about that. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask them. I will try and keep an eye on the chat as I go along. There's a lot of games to get to, and I have a hard stop in two hours and 15 minutes for stuff that I, errands and everything that I need to, uh, that I need to run. Um, what else? There is one other thing that I'm going to touch on uh, here in a little bit, but I guess we can go ahead and start going. So looking at this, I was going to start kind of with the small boxes and then 
uh, go up to the big boxes. There wasn't any real rhyme or reason, so please don't read into, oh, he muled this game, didn't mule that game. Personally with him, it, uh, it became a question of weight and size is all this is. Uh, there were a couple of exceptions here that I'll point out when I get to them, but for the most part, it was just what nested inside of what and what could we mule and what do we think we should ship. That's it. So please don't, don't read into, oh, wow, he must be really excited about that because he muled that. I'll point those out when we get to them. Otherwise, there's that. And yes, I love coconuts, Giovanni. So hi, everybody. I realize I haven't said a hi. Uh... Cool. Garav says the Daily Diaries were awesome for those of us that aren't privileged to be at Essen. For those that are here in the States and cannot drive to Gen Con, I would argue that Essen is cheaper, including flights, to go to Essen than it is to go to Gen Con because of the prohibitive cost of the hotels at Gen Con. And if you're a fan of the types of games that we are, I think Essen is a better match than Gen Con. Uh, Gen Con is one of my least favorite conventions of the year. Essen is arguably my favorite, not named Heavy Con. Uh, yeah, really good times. All right, cool. So here we go. Um, Andrew asks, what are the upcoming streams in the next week? I'll be honest. I don't know. Uh, the show, I'll, I'll go ahead and start with that. The show is going to start back up, if you will, on Monday or I guess Sunday uh, is when we're going to do the uh, weekly look ahead. And right now, I have given it some thought, but I need to know availability of people and everything else. So I, I can't really answer that yet, Andrew. But I promise as soon as I know, you guys will know what games are going to be coming up. Um, yeah, so we'll go. Uh, oh, yeah, and Richard brings up a good point, too, regarding Spiel, that uh, if you speak English, language is a non-factor. Uh, everybody there speaks English, and yeah, it's not a problem, so... Good to know. All right, so let's go ahead and get started, guys. Um, I'm just going to work my way around for the most part. There are a couple of games that we got here that we actually picked up from Tony Boydell, uh, who was holding them from UK Games Expo. He had a huge, like, 16-kilo uh, box worth of box games uh, that he had held for us for Essen that we actually picked up at UK Games Expo, and I might as well cover those to begin with. And so, that said, that's, there we go. So the first one here, again, this was, and I apologize about the lighting, because the shadows, because there's stacks of games over there, I'm trying to uh, hide off camera a little bit. This is called I My Favorite Things. Um, I really don't remember a whole lot about what this was, but UK Games Expo, there. And we can pop this open real quick and show I My Favorite Things, kind of a little filler. And you can see, obviously, it's a, I want to say it's a Japanese game here. I'm uh, not going to go super in-depth because I can't remember. I think, actually, yeah, I, anything I tell you at this point's a guess. So moving on, we also got movable type. Uh, there at UK Games Expo, and if you notice right here, it has Ada Lovelace on here, and it says the award-winning card game that combines a classic feel with modern rules. Variety of card drafting styles, unusual victory mechanic, and the winner won't necessarily be the player with just the best vocabulary. All players are in the running until the final word is played. So, okay, cool little historic uh, card game, again, from UK Games Expo. Moving on. All right, so some small games. This one, Nuno, if you're out there watching, this one's your fault. So I had originally had this on my preview, uh, or my personal preview list, as far as uh, the games to check out, and I had seen it Wednesday on the SN preview, uh, kind of the, the media preview, and I was like, ah, eh, it looks okay, it's from uh, Lookout Spiel, and this is one of the very few that is actually unopened. You're going to notice a lot of these games, the majority of these games, are all, uh, are all open because we had to punch and nest a bunch of these games. Some of these actually are still going to be nested, so it'll kind of give you a behind-the-scenes look on some of the stuff that we did to get games home. Uh, 
All right, so peep mats or little songbirds here, and I had talked about this. Uh, Nuno, the guy who accused me every year of these are your fault, these games, and he actually turned me back onto this one, said he really enjoyed it. Um, so a little, small little rule book, so it's a small little card game here. And because I knew it was just a couple decks of cards, I figure I wasn't going to bother trying to, you know, unpack this, but it gives you an idea of what it looks like, okay? So, there we go. All right. Peep mats. Peep mats. Little songbirds. Try and bring this back out without showing off too much. I think that'll work. All right. So, there's that. Um, also, I had mentioned that I was looking forward to this and that none of the cards were in English that I saw. This one, obviously, is a English uh, bubble kiss deck for Agricola. All right. So, yeah. Um, it's an Agricola deck. Don't really need to go too much in depth about that. And before I go on to the next one, uh, let's see. Uh, John asks, HC has most often been a two-person project. Have you decided if HC will only uh, be only you going forward or will a person close to you be joining as an HC partner co-host at some point? Um, for those, I mean, obviously you guys know that Jess is helping out behind the scenes. That's going to continue. Obviously, she's going to be on some live streams. But for the foreseeable future, Heavy Cardboard is going to be just me right now with help behind the scenes from various people. Uh, James Mathis, uh, or uh, yeah, James helps out behind the scenes with uh, graphics. There's going to be somebody helping out with editing and so on and so forth. But outside of that, it's going to be uh, guests for the podcast and then the normal live stream. So for the foreseeable future, that's where... Uh, that's where things are going to sit there. All right. Grav asks, uh, any 18xx planned? If you can show off 1889 like you did with 46, it'd be awesome. 46 is the intro to run good companies, and 89 and 30 is the intro to the other type of 18xx. On that note, it was actually really, really cool to have met Joe, Joe Huber, the Joe Huber, and I also know a number of other 18xx players here in town. And the plan is, yes, there are going to be 18xx games coming um, here by the end of the year. Uh, Timing-wise, I just got back. I've been in Boston a week and a half. I ask a little bit of patience on that. But, yeah, a lot of good things are going to be coming in that regard. So let's keep moving on. So one of the other unique uh, games from Japan brand, turn that around, uh, Shibuya. So Shibuya, um, as you can obviously read right here, and by read I'm being funny because it's in Japanese and I can't read that. So apparently Shibuya is the world's uh, most busy pedestrian intersection uh, in the world. And so they made a game, an abstract game about that. And it's a very small box game, so you can tell by the size of my hand here. And here are a bunch of the components. So just a bunch of tiles and such. And the rule book is very, very small as well. And I do mean very small. So we have there. And there. So that's the entire rule book on it. Uh, hoping to stream this at some point. Uh, it plays, I believe, two to four players. Um, yeah, two to four players in about 30 minutes. Okay, as you can see right here. So, yeah, looking forward to this. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, one of four games that we picked up. I think it was four that we picked up from Japan Brand uh, Games for reviewing or live streaming, either or. All right, so Shibuya. Oop, sorry about that. Huh. Uh, oh, okay, Rand, thank you, says, I, my favorite things, which I had talked about earlier, trick taker that has suits based on topics, values, according to your friend's favorite things, know your friend's favorites, you'll do better in trick, in taking tricks, cool, well done, Rand, thanks, appreciate it, uh, Scott asks about Barrage, we'll talk about that here in a little bit, so I'll double back on that, uh, Scott asks if I demoed it and what my thoughts were, um, 
Pierre says, uh, I played the Peep Mats game at Gen Con. Clever design, but didn't feel very excited by it. Okay, cool. All right. Brian, I wish I could like Agricola. Hi, Brian. Hope you're doing well. Say hi to Nadine. All right, Daniel says Shibuya is great. Played it a few times this week. Good thinker. All right, cool, good deal. All right, let's move on. So one of the uh, more interesting stories, I think, uh, was the story for this one. I had just, the hall had just closed and the big crowd, uh, the big roar had gone up from everybody. It's Sunday at 6 p.m. I just finished shipping 60 kilos of, of games back to the U.S., obviously, back to here. Those should be here uh, within a week, maybe two weeks at most, all right? Um, and there were these two gentlemen, uh, Jeffrey here, and I think it was, it was Kenneth. So Jeffrey and Kenneth were patiently waiting for me to finish shipping the games. And as soon as I was starting to walk away, they ambushed me. And they said, do you have just a second and will you take our game and take a look at it and see if you want to review it or, or, or cover it on the show? And I was like, really? It's 6 o'clock. The con just ended. And really? And I was like, all right, two minutes, go. And lo and behold, Jeffrey was able to do it. So props to Jeffrey for that. So Sh Samurai Vassal, the card game. Uh, obviously, not a ton of components in this little victory point chits right here. And... A deck of cards. So the premise on this is everybody has the same six cards in their hand and they're playing and it's who plays the bigger uh, value card as well as they have some sort of rule breaker down here. But when you're playing with more than two players and it does play two to six players, as you can see if I can move my finger right there, uh, if one player plays a five and you're playing three players, one player plays a five value card and two players play three value cards. Well, three and three match, so that's six total. Six is higher than five. The five player takes their card, turns it face down. The players that played the three will score some amount of victory points based on what is on their card there. And obviously applying any rule breakers there. Then they play the next card, etc., etc. However, if the players that have cards in their tableau that are face up, i.e. they're on a winning streak, they, and they win again, they get to not only score the new win, if they win a second trick, if you will, uh, they not only score the current card, but also any other face up cards, whereas the losers have to turn all their face up cards face down and basically reset. And there's a whole stack of, I think it's 26 some odd different variable cards that everybody can pick randomly or get dealt one card so everybody has seven cards instead of six it sounded like a cool little thinky filler 20 minutes here and yeah so i was like yeah it sounded pretty cool okay so there was that so props to those guys for both being patient as well as uh pitching it in about two minutes so that was pretty cool so ice makes so there we go next um i believe we were just handed this game from uh, Iraklis over at Luda Creations. I'll be honest, I know nothing about it other than it's a terrifying picture of Mr. Cab Cabbage, Heads, Cabbage Heads Garden. So there we go, just deck of cards, some chits. There, there we go. Literally know nothing else other than that is probably the scariest box cover I've ever seen in my life. All right, so there's that. Uh, catching up on chat, uh, Paulo, great meetup at Essen. I appreciate that, Paulo. It was awesome seeing you and everyone else. So there we go. This is, uh, one to two players plays in 15 to 20 minutes. You know, as much as I do, you pro arguably know more about this game than I do. So there's that. All right. Giovanni, I hate these small box games. They're a nightmare to store. Well, as we go the, for shipping them, though, it made it not too bad. Uh, next up, we have a game that was on my I'm curious to check out list. And this is uh, Architectura from Game Brewer as well as Hobby World, as you can see here. Very small box, small game. Uh, two to four players, 30 to 45 minutes. And 
if you can hear, it's mostly empty. So we actually nested stuff inside of this. And yeah, so we'll go here. And Brian says, Mr. Cabbage, Hedge, Mr. Cabbage Head's garden is fantastic. So here we go. There's that and that. So a deck of cards there and the rule book in that space. So yeah, we use some of this space to, uh, to package up other games. Looked interesting, little uh, tile laying game, card laying game. Looked pretty good. Oh, just just wait, Dylan. Uh, the box in a box idea is rad. Well, you'll you'll see because some of these I I haven't gotten to for unpacking them. Uh, Garab says, "Love the last few review podcasts. What are the next review podcasts? Or is that also going to be discussed?" Uh, in the weekly look at that also is going to be discussed there. Um, I need to, now that I'm back, lock down. My goal is to try and plan out the next two months worth of content, uh, both for the podcast as well as for the, uh, for the live streams. Now, obviously there is some, there is some uh, fluidity, fluidity, easy for me to say about that. So keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, I'm going to give an idea of what it is that we have in mind after I'm able to make the schedule. I've been home for about 30 hours, so bear with me on that. Okay, cool. All right, cool. Yes, Russian nesting games, Chisholm. That's exactly kind of what we did. This next one, uh, not a heavy economic, but a economic game. Now, this one uh, story is, hold on. I need some tea, a moment. All right. So this was on my to check out list as well. And when we saw it, both Jess and I were like, eh, I'm not really sure if this fits. Uh, two to four players, plays in about an hour. The idea of a player driven manipulated market very much interests me. And I know it interests a bunch of y'all. However, when we saw it, we were like, eh, not really sure, until they said something that kind of put me over the edge as far as, yeah, I'm interested in this now. And what that was, was the fact that there are, in a four-player <clears throat> in a four-player game at least, there are going to be four different uh, currencies or cryptocurrencies that are, that are available in the game here. And I will, so you guys see that. So there are four different companies that are going to be available. However, one of these is going to be found to be fraudulent and it is entirely uh, dependent on player actions. No randomness as far as that aspect of it goes. And I was like, okay, fine. So one of these that you're going to be investing in is going to be worth zilch and you're going to be... Uh, uh, investing in these companies and, and it's all player driven. And I was like, yeah, okay. In that case, I'm in, I'm willing to give it a try. So there's that. So other than that, it, it looked okay. It has kind of a cartoonish look to it. One cool thing is all the people involved in the company, their business cards are actually look just like this and they can actually be used as promos in the game as well, which I thought was a really nice touch. Um, so there's, different cards here in the game. This is Bank of Debtzilla, it says. And there we go. So yeah, look at that. That one aspect of the game sounded really interesting. So I was like, yeah, willing to give this a try. So either listen for it or look for it in the coming uh, days, weeks, and months. All right. So that is cryptocurrency. All right. Grab. Okay, I'm sold on cryptocurrency. I'm not yet, but we'll see. It sounded interesting enough to grab a copy. All right. Um, all right. So the next one here uh, came in three parts. So the first one, and this is very much, these are not the heavy big box games, obviously, but we have Railroad Inc., the Blazing Red edition here. Nice little, uh, it's held on by a magnet here. So listen. It's just kind of nice. I like that. Um, so it's supposed to be a thinky filler uh, game and railroads. So yeah, uh, but we'll see. Uh, kind of a dice uh, rolling, you know, type thing. 
uh, akin to steamrollers a little, maybe. So there's that. Again, sorry about the lighting with the big stack of games that's over here, guys. So there was that. There is the deep blue edition as well, okay? And it also came with uh, another little expansion here that, uh, that I obviously haven't opened up because it's just that. So there we go. So there's Railroad Inc. That this very well might be something that we'll be able to do live, interactive with uh, the peanut gallery at a uh, time down the road. So there's that. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's one. Um, another one. Let's see. Catching up on chat. Is anyone keeping a list of all the games? I, I hope so. Um, yeah. So that... I hope so, so I don't have to, all right? All right, another, uh, so you guys know that Coimbra came out. Well, there is a small box little expansion here, and the box actually, again, held on by a magnet, flips up like so. So, there we go. It's, it's that and that, and there you go. The dice box. Uh, it's a small expansion. says adds a few more features to phases A and B to the uh, and to the final scoring. All right. So. Oh, cool. Tales tellers taking notes. I appreciate that. Thank you very much on behalf of everybody. So. Um, that and one of the very few things that I actually mulled back for somebody was uh, a uh, expansion of that as well. All right. Um, so here's another one. This was uh, this was really nice. The uh, the guys at Looping Games were super kind, and unfortunately, the main thing from them did not arrive uh, yet. I, I did not mule it. We actually packed the main game from looping games is a game that i wasn't even looking at getting it was Tapum, i i think it's a tapum or something like that i forget the exact pronunciation of it but the main game that i was interested in from them was a another small box game 1906 san francisco from looping games uh two to four players 45 minutes and here it says early morning, okay, be a property developer for the rapid reconstruction of San Francisco during the five years uh, after the large scale destruction. And this uh, sounded really interesting to me. It had a cool theme, plus the actual layout uh, on the table looked good and they're really nice guys. Picked up a copy and hopefully we'll be able to show this one off down the road as well. And I can't wait when the uh, big box of Tapum, Tapu, ah, I forget, I'm sorry. But they did something really, really special inside the cover of the box that I want to show you guys. But yeah, so 1906, San Francisco was on my must pickups games. Um, looking forward to trying, uh, uh, trying to, to show this off for them. So there we go. Cool. All right. Uh... All right, let's see. Oh, uh, another that we picked up at UK Games Expo, uh, Rampunctious. Um, it's a punish party game about making terrible puns. Well, this is one that we're going to require Rainer in chat for to be able to play this. But yeah, this is, I mean, I love bad puns. Horrible. Love them. So anyway, little, it was just a fun little pickup, whatever. Um... I believe this got handed to us at UK Games Expo as well, and I literally don't know a thing about it. Antares, the dice game from Warlord Games, and this was just another that came in the uh, that was in the box uh, that Tony Boydell had held for us. So there we go. I know nothing about this, so we'll find out. All right, moving on uh, from the folks over at Thunderglyph Games. Uh, Thunder Griff, I screw that up every time. We have Spirits of the Forest, gorgeous looking card game uh, that I was a really, really big fan of Tao Long that we had live streamed. I think it was Michael and I had live streamed and they had shown me this 
uh, game at Gen Con or at Origins. I can't remember which one. This looked really good. Again, falls into Thinky Filler, one to four players, uh, 20 minutes, um, so not a big game. All these, a lot of these small box games are going to be uh, hopefully Thinky Filler and go from there. But yeah, so Spirits of the Forest, and again, it feels pretty full, so I didn't bother punching this one or opening this up yet. But you know what? It's got really pretty artwork, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that. Yes, bought myself a box of fire starters. Exactly. <laughs> hey, Brant. Thanks. All right. So we have different languages, rule books. Not a big, not a big game here. And then there, uh, I really don't want to have to open up decks of tiles. So they're not cards. I, I misspoke. They are actually tiles, um, but shows some of the colors on these and that, and everything comes in this little package there. Everything's pre-punched little gems. There we go. Uh, I actually saw, uh, Gone, Gonzalez, uh, who's one of the main guys there at uh, Thundergriff, saw that him playing this and looked like a, the epitome of Thinky Filler. Looked really, really good. And I he was like, yeah, you interested in taking a look at it? I was like, heck yeah. So there we go. And by the way, for those that don't know, I do not say yes to uh, all these small games. Um, some get foisted on us, but the majority of these actually are contemplated and uh, I say no to some of these because I don't want to just take games just to take games. It's not really, I have enough. So yeah. Oh, hey, Vince is here. Uh, I, now would be a good time for me to mention about the, uh, the heavy cardboard uh, secret elephant. Uh, Vince has volunteered to head that up. So yes, the secret elephant is going to be coming. Um, I'm hoping by the end of the week, we'll be able to have that up and running for people to join up and to get going. That's our uh, secret Santa for the herd. So it's open to everybody uh, who did not um, welch in the, in the past, who did not not follow through. So it's open to everybody who wants to worldwide. And yeah, it should be a great time again this year. And also Vince, really appreciate you taking that on, dude. Thank you. Um, all right, next. So NSKN, you guys know uh, uh, Cuba. <laughs> I, I can't remember if I met here a moment. I can't remember if I had mentioned uh, this in the daily diaries, but this was this was flattering and kind and thoughtful of uh, the folks at NSKN and Cuba in particular. Cuba runs NSKN, and he came up to me on Saturday. And he's like, you know, man, I'm really upset at you. He said, uh, because of the help that you gave Teo Tawakin and the, the live stream and helping out with it at Gen Con, along with the various herd members, he says, uh, we sold out on Thursday of all the copies of Teo Tawakin that we had. And I haven't had anything to do the entire rest of, of, uh, Essen. And so, yeah, thanks a lot, dude. I've been bored out of my mind. He was kidding, but that was really a really kind and thoughtful sentiment that he, he gave. So I appreciate that. On that note, uh, one of their other games here. Um, so thank you, Kuba. And thank you to everybody that helped out at Gen Con and everything else uh, with Teo Tawakin. It's a really good game. Really good. Uh, if you watched uh, the, I realize we don't give um, roundtable discussions, but I think it's pretty well known that how much I really enjoyed that game. So yeah, uh, hopefully everybody got their copies. All right. Uh, the folks at NSKN had another game that I was curious to, to look at. Um, not necessarily for the show. This might be just for me. I was curious to look into it. Uh, Chronicles of Frost in the expansion here, a little card game. Uh, Let's see, I'll read the back of this here 
briefly. It's a fast-paced adventure game where you can play competitively, cooperatively, or solitaire. Choose one of six heroes, each with their own unique deck of cards representing their feats and abilities, and embark on quests that will lead you to into the perilous wilds. Unlock the full potential of the cards in your hand with skill tokens or by exerting your hero. Shape the modular map with every step you take. Build your deck as you play by both adding new cards and retiring some of the old ones into your personal chronicle. And whether you play competitively or cooperatively, when the game ends, look to your chronicle to see if you were bested by other heroes or the mal malvolent... Man Ugh. Okay. The bad mist of Val uh, Valskir. Or if you've emerged a legend to be told for ages to come. It looked interesting on the preview list, and I was curious to check this out. Um, again, it might just be for me. And it might not be for the show. It may be. We'll see. But just to give you an idea. Oh, obviously, this is does not go to that game. So there we go. And those do. There we go. So there's an example of what some of the cards look like here in the, ex uh, in the example, et cetera, et cetera. I just realized I didn't take that down. You guys didn't tell me that. How about we do this? There we go. Where were you all on that, huh? <laughs> so that's uh, Chronicles of Frost, and we'll see uh, we'll see if folks are interested in that, and if I think it would match or not. Okay. Now, malevolent. Whew, wow. Why can I not talk? Good thing I don't talk for a living, right? Uh, cool. All right. Um. So there's a, a handful of other small box games here. Let me get that out of the way here. Uh, Tony uh, Boydell over at uh, small, uh, uh, Surprise Stair Games, his company, The Cousins War, gave me a couple of uh, copies here to uh, give away. So appreciate that, Tony. So we'll be giving these away. Also, uh, you can see some of their partners, which we're actually friends with uh, most of these folks, Two Tomatoes, Frosted Games, and uh, Flying Lemur. So, cool. So, got a couple copies of Cousins War. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, small box games. So, here's one also from the folks over at Mind Clash Games. Cerebria, the card game. Now, with this said, it has nothing to do with the main Cerebria game. And Victor, who runs Mind Clash Games, was like, do you want it? And I was like, do you think it'd be good? He says, I think it's a good game. Uh, again, thinky filler, two to five, plays in about 25 minutes. Um, 65 different emotions to discover, constant player interaction, multiple ways to victory, and meaningful decisions. Basically, you're talking about heavy cardboard in a synopsis. So I was like, yeah, if you think so, Victor. He's like, yeah, I think so. So I was like, sure. So we'll check this out. Um, do you guys want to see it real quick? See if I can open it easily. All right, cool. Oh, sorry about that, guys. All right. All right, I will try and keep a box out there going forward. My apologies. And because it seems the, the du jour, we have another magnetic box opening. That's just fun. I like that. All right, so nice artwork on the inside as well here. The rule book. Robert, will I be going to Dice Tower West, formerly MeepleCon, uh, next year to be determined? I'm going to be scaling back my convention travel way back. Uh, ended up going to, I don't know, there's, there's essentially three more cons. Uh, this year, there's LobsterCon, which is an invite-only, small, local little thing for a weekend, which I don't really consider a typical con because it's local and it's basically like a game day weekend. Uh, and then there's BGG Con and PAX Unplugged. Will end up being, I think, like 18 conventions this year, 16, 18, and that's just too many. So we'll see. I'm not going to promise anything to be determined. We're going to try and figure that out over the next month or so. But you can see... Uh, and I can zoom in because these are real pretty and really cute. There we go. So some of the artwork on Cerebria, the card game. Okay. So 
So yeah, really cute. And oh wow, that's a, it's almost like a challenge coin, right? Super heavy. So there you go. All right, cool. So that is Cerebria, the card game. So, to be determined on that. Uh, all right, so let's see. I like that magnetic closure as a trend. I hope they made well enough that they hold up. Yeah, me too, same thing. Um, we'll, to be determined on uh, durability. Who's the artist for it? Um, let me see if I can find that out real quick. Again, trying to keep it in here. Uh, oh boy. You know what, I'm not even gonna try because I'm gonna embarrass myself on the pronunciation. So there you go, there's the artist. So, I'll, oh, I lied, I'll try. Vio Farkas, or Villo, I think it's Vio Farkas, with uh, Jamie Cycle and Pedro Alberto. So there you go, okay. So for at least the, the card game, which I imagine because it's the same artwork, I imagine it's the same for Cerebria as well. Cool, uh, let's see. All right, other small box games. Um, one of the two city explorers that we got from Moa Ideas um, sounded kind of interesting. Plan your next vacation with the City Explorer series. Enjoy a beautiful selection of 35 locations. And this is a City Explorer uh, Tynan. Um, cool. Yeah. So basically anything that Moa Ideas puts out, I'm going to be interested in. And this is no different. So while we're on the note of MOA Ideas, let's move that one out. And oh yeah, hey, finally got a copy of Symphony Number no. 9. Uh, this, I think, came out at Gen Con and unfortunately wasn't able to get a copy there, um, but was able to get one at uh, Essen. So here we go. And the next bad thing I hear about this game it will be the first. Uh, I, uh, David, uh, David at Moa Ideas, who runs it, um, ran me through a overview of this at Gen Con. It sounded really interesting. Uh, you become patron of the arts, which being, uh, seen as we have our Patreon over at pledgehc.com. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that idea. And all the components are actually stored in this box. I don't want to open it and repack it, but they're all individually packaged. So like uh, cards are in this uh, uh, Ziploc. They have other tokens that are in this Ziploc and everything. So nice and neat little way to do this. So we have there, we have that there, and boom, Symphony Number no. 9. You are definitely going to hear about on a podcast as well as see on a live stream. All right. Uh, let's see, other small box game. This is another that I w didn't feel the need to punch while I was there. Uh, so Lonnie, um, uh, or Leonard Orgler, so Lonnie, uh, and the uh, guys over at uh, Fox in a Box uh, gave me a copy of this to show off. It's 18XX, the card game. Was on Kickstarter, uh, became available uh, here at Essen, and I think it's already been out to backers, I think. I think. Um, anyway, this is another, I don't know, even know if you can call this a thinky filler. I mean, it's 60 to 90 minutes. Um, it's 18xx, the card game, and, or the tile lame. Yeah, so we'll see. Um, I'm definitely going to be showing this one off. Looking forward to that. And yeah, so, I mean, come on. It's the first of its kind. So I think this will be, uh, this will be, uh, this will be good to show off. And maybe could be a stepping stone to getting into uh, 18xx games for folks. Uh, Jasmir asks, have you tried and have an opinion on the big box Cerebria, Anachrony, or other games from Mind Clash? The only one I've tried so far was Tracurian, and uh, with the Dark Alley expansion, I really like that game. I have Anachrony, haven't tried it yet, and Cerebria, you're going to see when another box comes. So yes, got that as well, but have not tried it. So can't speak to any of those yet, um, other than Tracurian and a really, really big fan of that. And I'll be honest, uh, Cerebria uh, at first became interested in because, uh, as you guys know, with Amanda's uh, mental health uh issues that she deals with that um, the fact that it worked on emotions in dealing with those 
and putting faces to some of the scarier and better emotions really the kind of hit home and was really interested in it and still am and we'll see how it plays though all right cool uh let's see a lot of people are like yes yeah, symphony number no. nine so good all right cool all right good deal uh Scott asks if I've gotten an invite to uh, the Gathering of Friends. I have not, but I'm still going to be able to go. But I'm hoping to get an invite to the Gathering of Friends. But either way, I know I'll be attending next year. So there's that. I'm excited. Thank you, Jess, for that. Um, but I would like to be able to get in on my own merit. So we'll see if that ever comes to be. So 18 Lilliput from uh, Lonnie, as well as the guys over at Fox in a Box. And I forget, I want to say his name was David. Um, he also spoke to working together on future Kickstarters for 18xx games, um, being able to get us early uh, proto or late version prototypes ahead of the Kickstarter so that we can uh, show those off for you guys as well. So going forward, hopefully working more with Fox in a Box um, and Lonnie for any of their 18xx games. So there's that. All right, moving on. So here's an expansion for a game that I have but don't have physically here yet. Mini World War II, if you listen to the preview show, you know I was really stoked for this. And the Mini World War II is in one of the boxes that I shipped to get here, so it's not here, but the expansion map is here. So there we go, all right? So there we go, that is the expansion. Cool, all right. Uh, some other small box games. Um, so, another that I was at least partially interested in, uh, Small Star Empires, second edition from uh, Arcana Games, I think is how you pronounce it. You know, so a little behind the scenes thing on this real quick before I open this. So, there are some of these smaller publishers that do know uh, who various reviewers are, myself included in that, and others that do not. And they were not super sure. Uh, a lot of these publishers get requests for a ton of review copies from various reviewers, this and that. And they usually have a general policy of either no or we'll give you a discount or this and that or come back or whatever, something like that. And it was pretty funny to run into these guys and they were like, yeah, well, maybe come back on Sunday. And come Sunday, they were really, really excited. I think they looked up the show at that point and they were very interested in us uh, grabbing a copy of this. So Small Star Empires, we will see whether or not it's a game we want to cover or not. So we have that. Um, this also includes the expansion in it, the expansion box obviously we're probably not going to keep but some of the expansion components here tiles and wooden pieces more wooden pieces you got little gems cards etc etc that are all through this so there is a ton of stuff in this game um including the expansion obviously that uh that looked interesting and we will find out more as we go along. So, Small Star Empires from Arcana. Yeah, Arcana Games. And I believe they are one of two companies, and I might be getting this wrong, I apologize if so, that is one of two Macedonian publishers. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what it looked like. And it says, colonize and conquer the galaxy in this highly engaging, easy to learn, quick to play area control game for two to four players. So, our kind of games. Uh, two to four players in about 15, 20 minutes. All right? More thinky filler. Hopefully. Hopefully. All right? That's getting really tall there, isn't it? Let me move that over. Uh, all right. Catching up on chat, right? Got to bring a game in. Oh, hey. Yeah, I also picked up this game. Uh... Oh, that's cool. Rand says the designer of Mini World War II went straight to Arnhem after uh, Spiel to visit the bridge. Really cool to see his passion. That's awesome. Oh, good. Dennis says wooden custom parts instead of plastic for small star empires. Looks more interesting to me. I agree. There's something to be said. I like custom wooden pieces much more so than plastic. Uh, yeah, 
I mean, that's a, that's a taste issue, I realize, but yeah. So, uh, Pax Emancipation, got this out, and um, I don't want to definitively say anything, but I, I will say this, that there is a very good opportunity for heavy cardboard and ion game design. Uh, the company that Phil Eklund and Sierra Madre Games sold or partnered up with, however you want to word that, uh, there's a very good chance that we work together on all their games going forward. Um, not so much PAX Transhumanity, which just went live on Kickstarter, but going forward, um, we're probably going to be working together to highlight all of their games going forward, which that is the epitome of perfect partnership, I think, between uh, Sierra Madre Games, Ion Game Design, and Heavy Cardboard. So really, really excited about that, all right? So, yes, PAX Emancipation, uh, there, there's a lot of game in this little box. I mean, there's the rule book. Uh, the good news is, have a good game group in which to play this here as well. And then the advanced game and the glossary. And it is chock full of wood and cards. So... Just different wooden pieces, and you're going to see a lot of similar pieces between the various uh, PAX games, as well as stuff like BIOS Megafauna 2, etc. Um, we have a few dice, some extra baggies, appreciate that. Little punch boards, a uh, little basic game player aid, it looks like here. Or no, these are player tableau cards, I think. Uh, there, punch boards. And then the, main, the actual game, here we go, with various cards. All right. Is it a typical Eklund rule book? Um, from the looks of it, yes. But any more than that, I can't really say, just from the looks of it. And Adam says, yep, it is. All right. So let's get this back in there. See if we can play Tetris by... Getting, you know what, before we do that, let's do this. Put those bad boys back in. There, and hope we can actually make it somewhat close to fitting. Close enough for government. There we go. Pax Emancipation. All right. Let's see. Oh. Here's one of the few boxes that did not make it. Terraforming Mars Colonies. It was way too big a box for what came in it. Well, no, it fit because the punch boards... But I wasn't going to mule it because it was mostly empty. So, Terraforming Mars Colonies, that's the entire rule book for it. You have some of the punch boards. Deck of cards there. Some cubes and some arrows that can also host little cubes for the expansion, and that is colonies. So there we go. More to be, uh, more to come on that. I'm sure we stream Terraforming Mars with the expansion down the road as well. So there we go. All right, so Strange Vending Machines. Uh, this was from SoSo -So Games? Yeah. Uh, I like well, much like Rand and James and Jess, I like uh, quirky games, I think is a good way to put it. And this definitely uh, definitely fits that, that niche, uh, fits that uh, with Strange and Quirky. Um, wait till I open this here in a minute. Let me catch up on chat real quick. Let's see... Uh, Ufa, I think maybe is how you say it. It says Sierra Madre Ion and Heavy Cardboard. That's a power horse, a powerhouse of Heavy Cardboard Paradise. Appreciate it. Um, how about Ion Games just adding QR code linking to Heavy Cardboard instead of rule books? Anyway, these rule books become obsolete before they reach early backers. I'm not going to go so far as to say making them obsolete, but that QR code could be a possible idea there. Um, that's something that uh, that absolutely could happen uh, when it, for for something like that. So we'll see. To be determined on that. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, and Nick says this is definitely quirky, talking about strange vending machine, but not much of a game. Uh, oh, and the majority of these are punch, Sasha. You'll see. You'll see. So here we go. So um, I just I love the fact that this is there's just vending machines in this. They're like little cardboard vending machines. I'm like that's awesome. And there's two or two in each of the three colors. Deck of cards here. And some chits. There you go. And that was everything that was in Strange Vending Machine. So you have Muscle Man's Purchase uh, Challenge there. And ingredients and recipes of the mystery, mysterious wizard. There we go. All right. You can go coin fishing and shake down the machines, Rand says. Uh, all right, cool. So there you go. I don't know if you're actually going to see it on the show, but you'll, you'll definitely hear about it on the podcast. So there's that. All right. Okay. All right. Nick says the components were fun and there were fun moments. Um, uh, but the games are basically just very simple set collection. Okay. So Grimora. Gr Grimoire, Grimoire, I, I give up. Christoph, you're killing me. So Christoph Matsutsik, a fan, uh, friend of the show, a designer of Craftsman. Um, he's kind of been a friend of the show ever since we covered Craftsman way back, way back in the early days. Because we were the only ones to really give that any love. And ever since, he's, like I said, been a friend of the show. Well, at, if you listen to the Daily Diaries, I talked about how he had a couple of prototypes. Um, last year, he showed me a prototype, and I put him in contact with a couple of publishers uh, who I thought would be good matches, and he got his game signed with one of those publishers. So trying to help out friends um, in games that I thought would be good matches. And did the same this year as well. He had two games. Uh, prototypes that he showed me and the second of which kind of felt like an old school Merton Wallace Waro and uh, is going to be signed with one of the two publishers that I recommended he touch base with with the game so it's really cool to be able to help out people like that realize their dreams uh, and really flattering the fact that he thought enough about my opinion to show me the games and to try and match that up and thought that was, thought that was, uh, thought that was pretty cool. So anyway, he gave me a copy of this. I know nothing about it. He said, "Here's a copy of my latest game." Uh, and who is it? Uh, uh, Terrence says Grimoire. So there you go. It's Grimoire. Thank you. Uh, Two-player, uh, twenty-minute thinky filler. Just some punched chits here and various cards. Show you guys some of the artwork on the cards. I'll zoom in just a hair for this. There we go. So, gives you an idea of the artwork. I know nothing about it. Uh, Christoph's here. Take a look. Uh, enjoy it if you want. And don't give it away if you don't. Um, I was like, okay, cool. So, there we go. So, Grimoire from Christoph. Chris. Christoph Matutsik, or Chris, as he wants me to call him, and Octopus Games, apparently. All right, cool. All right, now we're getting into the bigger boxes. Here we go. One of my anticipated games for something a little bit different is A Pleasant Journey to Neko from a designer of City Low and from The Wood Games. Uh, this is another company that asked me to come back on Sunday to see if he had copies available, and he did, and he was very excited at the prospect of us taking a look at this. Um, I didn't promise any kind of reviews for uh, pretty much any of these games, but going to let the games themselves dictate uh, what kind of coverage these get after we play them, whether or not we stream them, whether or not we review them, or whether or not we just talk about them on the show. So there we go. All right. Uh, cool. All right. So, Pleasant Journey to Neko. If 
you did not listen to the Essen preview show that I that I recorded uh, right before Essen started. This was on the uh, top five, top, sorry, top six uh, quirky games that I was looking forward to. Um, okay, Rand says uh, pleasant journey was exactly that, quite pleasant. So, all right, cool. Oh, and apparently Dylan from Quality Bee says right on. City is a wonderful human. Seemed like a very very kind, gentle uh, gentleman uh, when I met him. So that was cool. All right, cool. And he does all of his own art, uh, uh, Dylan says. Cool. All right. So there we go. So again, all of these, uh, I can't remember what was punched and what wasn't because the majority, almost everything that you're going to see at this point will have been punched because we had to nest games within. So lots of custom wooden pieces here. Some cards. More custom wooden pieces, wooden cubes, lots of dice. It is a uh, dice drafting type game. Uh, custom wooden anchors. That's cool. Uh, the rule book, the board down there, and some of the player boards. It looks busy, but actually it looks very well laid out. Keep in mind, I've not played anything that you're about to see with the exception of one game. Yes, one game. I lied, two games. All right, there we go. All right. All right, so that is A Pleasant Journey to Neko. You're definitely going to be hearing something about this uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months. So there we go. All right, next up, we have uh, a game that came out last year but came out with a expansion this year, and that is, oh my god, that is heavy, Wendake. I know that a lot of people have said very good things. Uh, this is from Placentia Games. Also, I believe Renegade uh, is partnering up with them and bringing out Wendake, but they do not have the expansion yet. We do, so there's that. So, this is going to have... This is the base game as well as the expansion. And if you can see, this is completely full. The expansion does fit in there. The, the expansion box did not make the trip. And this thing weighs a lot. I mean, I don't know if you can hear that, but that is extraordinarily heavy here. All right. Um, so bunch. And it had a ton of things to punch. So as you can see, all this has to get sorted. Uh, yeah. So I'm not really looking forward to that. Um, Cool, and if, you ha if you're not familiar with Wendake, it has cool little beaver chets on it, so that's kind of cool. There we go. Yeah, I've heard a lot of really, really good things about Wendake, all right? So we have uh, cards, lots of wooden bits. A ton more of things that were punched <laughs> and more and more and more custom wooden bits here yeah this thing weighs a ton so expansion wise I can't remember what components were expansion and which were base game but we have here and these are uh, there's a little cutout here in those. And same, so they're dual layer uh, boards here. And there we go. So that uh, new allies being the, uh, being the, uh, expansion and it comes in a whole bunch of different uh, languages so it's a massive rule book which adds to the weight which is unfortunate and then boards out here all right cool so Wendake and the expansion thanks to the folks over at uh, Placentia for this one you're definitely going to be hearing about this and likely seeing this on the show in the coming down the road we'll say that and now good luck trying to fit all this stuff back in Edward 
But yeah, this, this, this got nested only with the expansion and, uh, and the base game. Because there is a ton of stuff in this box. Good enough for now. We'll fix it later. Uh, yeah, uh, fun times with the sorting. Not looking forward to that. So here, I finally got to meet Vladimir Suchi. So Vladimir Suchi is the designer of Shipyard as well. And Shipyard, one of my favorite midweight Euros, which I would love to show to you guys. And also Shipyard has a special place in my heart because Shipyard was uh, episode zero. It was our test episode uh, that Tony and I did before we recorded episode one, which was Madeira for the podcast. So I have a special place in my heart for Shipyard. And Vladimir Suchi's English apparently is as good as my Czech, um, meaning he doesn't speak English hardly at all, or at least he doesn't publicly that I know of. And uh, I don't speak any Czech. So there was a translator at the booth, and he was like, I told him, I said, uh, Vladimir, I'm a really, really big fan of Shipyard. Thank you for the game. And he looked at me and said, this is better. Okay, so we will see. So Underwater Cities was definitely one of my more anticipated games. Uh, and this is coming from Delicious Games, which I believe, and forgive me if I'm wrong on this, is his wife's publishing company. And I think, let me bring that off. Oh, yeah. So here you go. Here's a good example of nesting. So this is one that I haven't gotten to yet. Okay. So there we go. So we actually have, I think, four games in this box. So forgive me real quick while I unbox these. So we have Q Birds, which just look cute. Don't, from uh, Blackrock Games. Not sure if uh, Q Birds is going to be a heavy cardboard game or whether it's just a cute little fun thinky game. Hopefully, thank you. Uh, but we have there and there for underwater cities. And I think that's it for Q-Birds. So we will put this. So there we go. From Stefan Alexander and uh, Catch-Up Games, which we got this from Blackrock Games. So Q-Birds. Okay. So there's a good example of nesting number one. Then we have nesting number two, a moment. And this is Astro Drive. And this is from Lotta Pellet and Miko uh, Punicalio, who is a patron, but also designer, more importantly, designer of Docmas. And he showed us this game and he's like, I don't know if you're going to like this. He said, it's pretty, it's, it, it, it's a fun filler, but not sure how heavy it is, et cetera, et cetera. And he gave us a quick little run through of it. And it sounded like a cute little fun little game. And so we were like, yeah, maybe. So there we go. So Miko, appreciate that. So 79 cards, 19 wooden parts, and the rules. So there we go. This is Astro Drive. So we'll see how it fits. Again, thinky filler. So that would be that one. And grabbing the box there. All right. I have no idea, Vince. He said, how many games total? And expansions did you pick up at Essen? I want to say it's upwards of about 150, give or take, but I could be way off on that and I didn't count. Uh, things were too chaotic, so sorry about that. Um, not sure. Uh, good news, Jeff. You can always go back and watch it after the fact. So also you'll notice another game that did not make the uh, trip, uh, the box, is the expansion to Great Western Trail, Rails to the North. So before we get to Underwater Cities, let's go ahead and... Hit that one up. <laughs> so yeah, you got to see. So there were four games in this box. So this is the expansion uh, board. Move that out of the way. There we go. The expansion board for uh, Great Western Trail, Rails to the North. Oh, and this was pretty interesting. It had this little thing in it that said, "Attention, the box includes wooden components by mistake." They're not needed in the game, and you can remove them. And because I was nesting so many different games into the same boxes, and it's really hard to tell what wooden components go to what game, 
and I didn't have a Sharpie with me. Normally you would write, you know, GWT on the, on the bag for, for Great Western Trail. Well, what I did was I know what these styles are being from Great Western Trail. So any components that were from Great Western Trail, I threw in one of those tiles to remind myself, oh, those are for Great Western Trail. This does not have that. So ergo, it's not from Great Western Trail. Same with there. So there we go. All right. So Great Western Trail expansion. And let's see, this one also is from Great Western Trail. And these guys were as well. All right. So that is the Great Western Trail expansion. So we'll move those aside somewhere for now. And then here we go. Underwater cities. Back to this. Hey, Nick. All right, cool. Tony says, well done. The Great Western Trail expansion sold out halfway through day one. All right, good to know. Um, yeah, so extra free components. Cool. So these are a ton of the different punch board stuff. And there are some really, really small pieces. So be careful. If you get underwater cities, there are these really kind of small little tiles right there. So be careful not to uh, throw those out accidentally when you uh, when you're punching your copy this is definitely going to be covered both on the podcast and the YouTube channel uh, live stream wise eventually and little plastic pieces there decks of cards which there we go we have these little half don't little domes in two different colors more punch board pieces and the rule book And it's pretty, pretty meaty. I mean, it's pretty, there's a lot of stuff in this. All right. And then the actual board itself, I'll go ahead and zoom out a little bit and show you guys. The board is, uh, it's double-sided, but it's awfully thin um, material here. I'll zoom out a little bit more. I don't want to give away too much here, though. There you go. That's about as far as I'm going to zoom. So it gives you an idea. So there's that, and as I mentioned, it's double-sided. I assume that's for player count. Okay. There we go. Okay. But yeah, it's super thin. So we'll see how that holds up. And then there. So hopefully you guys are enjoying this, uh, the fact that it came back and try to get going live as soon as possible with all this. Um, not going to, actually that. Mm. Yeah, gonna take them out, so that's it. There, there. The Great Western Trail stuff will stay out. Try and not lose components for all that. A moment, y'all. Card quality, um, Pete says, is a little low. Um, okay, good to know. Uh, Underwater Cities has an almost four weight rating on BGG. I imagine that's just because uh, it's new, um, and I think that'll come down, Brian, but we'll see. I don't know. Maybe it won't. Um, but yeah, definitely. This is one of the games that I intentionally uh, did pack up. Uh, early to try and uh, get to as soon as possible, uh, rel you know, relatively speaking. And this was another one just because it's super small, even if I'm not going to get to it super quickly. So just FYI. All right. All right. Oh, wow. Tony says, wife hated the components for underwater cities enough to not purchase it. Wow. All right. Uh, where do we go next? Um, sure, let's go and go this way. So, Kingdom Defenders was a game that I wasn't sure. It was on my to-checkout list as we went around, and it has the distinction of, and this is purely coincidental, being the first uh, game that I picked up at Essen this year. Uh, not for any rhyme or reason, other than they happened to be the first booth that I really stopped at and that they were set up 
at a point to where I could touch base with them and check out the game. So uh, two to four players plays in about 90 minutes. Uh, so let's see. It says uh, Kingdom. Uh, actually, none of that is in English. Never mind. So the English rules I had to come back for on Sunday to pick up a copy, but I can show you guys the box a little bit. Just from an aesthetic standpoint, it looked interesting to me. Uh, yeah, Rio Grande picked up Underwater Cities. All right. Thanks for the info, Nick. Cool. So there we go. So we'll go ahead. This, uh, this is a pretty solid box. I can't remember if this has stuff nested in it. In it or it does so kingdom defenders we're going to get to this in a little bit why because inside kingdom defenders is tales of Kipat kipatau i'm so terrible about this another game that we got from so so games so this nested inside of that and we'll come back to this and if i'm going to guess there are probably a game or so inside of this one I think it's just those two games, so we'll see. So the Tales of Ki Patawa, uh, or Patau, pa Patau, oh, boy, from Miso Games and So-So Games. <sighs> two to four players, 25 to 40 minutes. It looked interesting. Um, Jess was really interested in this one, but I'll be honest, the selling point for me was... So, had different characters that were a uh, uh, little punch uh, that you, you get represented by. But the interesting one here, as Rand just said, the capybara. I mean, dude, look, I mean, seriously, it's a capybara, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and... There we go. So the Capybara game. Had to pick up a copy of this. Uh, just on the cute factor alone. We'll see. Cool. Um, so wooden pieces, are these are going to be mixed between Kingdom Defenders and the Capybara game. Tales of Ki Patau. So I think these should be pretty easy to be able to tell which is what component. Uh, so... There we go. There's the capybara again. So it has board, or, or these are uh, player boards here. And a bunch of tiles that had to punch out. The board for uh, tails. And there we go. So I'm not going to go too much more as well. And this is, like I said, mixed with uh, Kingdom Defenders. But it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory which game is which. Um, unless uh, the Capybara is going to be fighting off Cthulhu. Um, I, think, I think we can probably tell what's what. So there's that. But let's go ahead and take a look at the board for Kingdom Defenders. Like I said, you notice all of these and player shields here underneath there. Uh, all these boxes, except for one, which I haven't gotten to yet, uh, have made it all unscathed just about. So yay to, um, I guess that'd be British Airways and Virgin Airlines for taking care of the uh, luggage and the stuff that we packed in the backpacks and the carry-ons. This is a six-panel board. Oops. A moment. Let me take that now. All right. So again... I'm trying to not reveal some of the other games. A little bit of mystery. So we'll do this kind of area of the board by area of the board. Kind of a thematic Euro is kind of uh, my take on this. There we go. Sort of. So yeah, look pretty interesting. Um... Again, a lot of these games uh, that I'm picking up at Essen are best guess uh, scenarios, and we'll see. And I told everybody that we will let the games themselves dictate how much coverage they're going to get, whether it's the, uh, the playthrough 
uh, review on the podcast or or both or just mentioned on the podcast uh, in the case of some of these games. Oh, yeah, we tried it, this and that, whatever, eh, whatever. So we'll go from there, all right? Yeah, I mean, seriously, love myself some capybara. Who doesn't, mm -hmm. right? So Kingdom Defenders. Next up, the latest from Richard Breeze, Keyflow. Uh, so... I had a fortuitous, serendipitous, I think serendipitous would be a good way to word this, meeting with uh, Richard Breeze. He was talking to Mariano uh, Ianelli from What's Your Game, uh, and both all of them are, are friends. And I happened to come up to Richard Breeze's booth while they were talking about how does Richard do a better job of getting his games out there. And I said, well, you're Richard Breeze. Uh, that that helps, and then we we're talking about uh, possibly working together for his future releases as well. Um, in addition to what Paul Grogan does with his uh, stuff, with the rule book and the amazing uh, videos that Paul does over on Gaming Rules, uh, Richard talking about working with us for Key Market and other games going forward, which would be a huge honor because Key Market. It's funny he was like, so you know. Key market's coming. I said, Richard, go back to BGG and take a look at the thread about, oh yeah, if this gets X amount of thumbs, Richard said he would uh, reprint it. Who's the guy who started that thread? This guy. So yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm super excited about getting a, a copy of Key Market. And he's like, do you have a copy? I was like, no, that's why I wanted the reprint to happen. So he said he's going to try and get me a copy of the original so we can do a live stream of it. For the Kickstarter, um, obviously it'll be using the new or the old version, but still, nonetheless, super excited to, at the prospect of working with Richard going forward. So, yay. Again, seems like a good match for what it is we do, as well as he's Richard F. and Breeze, so father of the worker placement. So, yeah, really excited about that prospect. Anyway, key flow. Here we go. Let's show this up. All right. Did I get to see City of the Big Shoulders? Should we be hyped for the game? Kurt, um, I'm super excited about it. I've had a, a late prototype of it, and you're going to see a playthrough of it here uh, next in the next couple of weeks. So, yes, I'm excited about it, Kurt. Yeah. So, key flow. Here we go. Now, this did not get nested because... Um, I'll be honest, I didn't, I didn't do a whole lot of reading up on it, but the, the way the insert works, I did not want to mess with this. So this is everything that is there for Keyflow. All the punch boards, all that got punched, but nothing got nested. A bunch of wooden components and a bunch of cards. So Keyflow, there we go. The latest in the key series from Richard Breeze. There we go. All right. So R&D Games and Hooch, or Huck, I forget how you pronounce it. Anyway, them. There we go. I did not get a copy of 1830. Um, I have the original, well, the original Mayfair. Uh, basically, it's the exact same game. However, uh, it's, uh, there we go. There, there's a little, little terrible uh, foreshadowing um oh you know what here i will do this there we go so it has something to, to zoom in on um where were we oh right 1830 so that uh it's the same game nothing's changed just some uh uh functionality improvements in the game so i did not get a copy of that um okay cool all right so couple of things. So first off, we're going to talk about Barrage and Kickstarter. So let's have a moment before we get into it. So Kickstarter games. There are two types of people out there uh, that watch and listen to this show. There are those that have zero interest in crowdfunding, and there are those that see crowdfunding as a good thing or that do partake in crowdfunding, whether it's Kickstarter or other ones. I 
have made a commitment to my patrons, uh, the 747, yep, 747 of y'all out there, thank you, to limit the number of Kickstarter uh, playthroughs that we do, sponsor playthroughs as well, um, because uh, I don't want to be the show that is all Kickstarters all the time. So I have promised to limit those each month. When I was at Spiel, I had the opportunity and was approached and had meetings with various publishers that have Kickstarters that are upcoming. So there were two that I spoke about already uh, that everybody knows that we're going to be doing, both Pipeline for Capstone Games and City of the Big Shoulders over for Parallel Games. Two games that I've been expecting and anticipating for the better part of 18 months to two years. The other two that I was approached about uh, one of which is Barrage. Now, there was a very big discussion in Slack, uh, in the patron-only Slack channel, about Barrage and the Kickstarter, and so on and so forth, and people asking if Cranio Creations would get us a prototype of it to be able to show the game off. And there's one other, which I'll get to next after Barrage, uh, that, uh, oh, well, I'll talk about that later. So I feel like I have an obligation to folks to present games and help you guys make decisions on whether or not games will be a good match for you and your game group. And whether that's through traditional publishing or through crowdfunding, whether it's Kickstarter or whatever. And I think I do a pretty good job of choosing games, selecting games that I feel are either good matches for the show, which is the predominant focus, or games that I think would be good stepping stones um, that have the core being good games that would be for people that would help step them into more heavy cardboard-centric games. And so the focus, again, being to... How do I say this? The focus being whether traditional or Kickstarter to help you get, present games to you and let you make your own decision on whether or not games would be good for you and your group. Now, traditional ga published games, are I, if I get ahead of, uh, get an early copy or whatever, try and show it off, fine. Or more often than not, like take a shipyard or I'd say 75%, if not more, of the games that we cover have already been out, whether it's even a Kalis or something like that. You could go, you can go buy a copy, and you can make your own decision by purchasing a copy. Kickstarter games, you guys don't have access to. And on occasion, I will either be offered or uh, sent copies or uh, discuss whether or not I want copies sent, whatever, for Kickstarter games to be able to present them to you guys to help you make a more informed decision. And Barrage is a perfect example of that. Because I saw this big discussion going on in Slack, I thought, oh... Well, it's a game I want to check out. Rado and Man vs. Meeple, uh, they both reached out to me before Essen and said, hey, uh, I can send you our copies if you're interested. Hey, well, the folks at Cranio Creations were really, really apologetic for having not shipped us a copy and wanted to see if we could do something and work with them ahead of the Kickstarter being finished. So I have a dilemma. Do I feature a game that is yet another Kickstarter preview, not preview, but a, a, a playthrough of a game that's on Kickstarter that I do think is a really, really good match for the show and for you guys and has enough people on the fence that I can help save, potentially say, say, help people make the decision whether it's to back it or not to back it. Um, but it's yet another third and what will eventually be a fourth Kickstarter video uh, playthrough in the month of November due to the timing. And here's the thing. There's going to be months where there's no Kickstarter uh, playthroughs because there's an ebb and flow to the way these games come out. And there's an ebb and flow to, oh, wow, there's a bunch of heavy cardboard type games coming out now, and then there's none. And then there's some, and then there's more, and then there's none, and there's a few, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this is the dilemma that I'm having to struggle with on where do I draw the limit? Because if I think they're games that I think would absolutely be a good match for me being the types of games that I enjoy and the types of games that you guys enjoy, should I do that? 
I think the answer is yes. I really do because I see it as a, as a service that I'm providing to you guys because you guys can't play this. Any of y'all out there have a copy of Barrage? Probably not. So it makes sense for me to do this, to help you guys with this stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I think so. So there's going to be an ebb and flow to this. And I just wanted to let you guys know that that's how I'm going to approach it because I did get presented with a number of opportunities and some of which I just flat out said no to because I didn't think they were a good match and I didn't want to commit to anything. However, there were two at Essen that I, I did say, yeah, I think uh, we can probably do this because I think they're going to be good matches. So I just wanted to kind of have a talk about this and, and let you guys know where I'm coming from and to solicit feedback, whether you're a patron or not. If you're watching this, you're interested in this stuff. So I would like feedback from you guys, whether it's in chat, whether it's in comments, if you're watching after the fact, emails, message me on Slack, or just have a discussion of this in Slack. Or over in the guild, 2044, over on BGG, the Heavy Cardboard Guild. Have a discussion of it there because I think what I do is provide a service and give you guys an opportunity to either save money by choosing, oh, wow, it looked good, but after seeing the playthrough, it's not a good match. Or, oh, wow, I think this is going to be a great game for me and my group. Yeah, now it helped me make a good decision because I've had people at Essen, I got stopped all the time telling me essentially the same thing. So I, I feel like it's an important thing that I do to help you guys make informed decisions. So that said, that's kind of where I'm la landing on the whole Kickstarter thing. Am I going to absolutely try and limit this to roughly two of these a month? Yup, I am. But there's going to be some where there's less. There's going to be some months where there's a little bit more. But I'm going to make sure that they're going to be curated for the types of games that I think you and I are going to be interested in. So enough about that. Let me catch up on chat a little bit and then we'll go into uh, Barrage. So there we go. Joe says you do a great job of helping to decide to buy. Uh, we report, you decide. Uh, feature it and let the herd make up their mind, Darren says. Cool. And Pierre says plus one for Barrage. And Jess says, two camps for sure, but getting to see a Kickstarter played before backing would have saved me a ton of cash last year and likely gotten a few I missed on to my radar. Um, Tony says, yeah, it's absolutely 100% in a heavy cardboard wheelhouse. Um, and Nick says, nothing wrong with Kickstarter previews of heavy cardboard wheelhouse games. Others, eh. Fair point. I, and I'm very much trying to limit, and let, like I said, unless they're stepping stone games. Uh, and Pierre... Uh, the Kickstarter is okay if the game's relevant. Uh, MK Rakoff says, Barrage seems to fit the core of the show. It's expensive and we need help deciding. Um, this will get retail, so that seems like a win-win. Um, okay. Uh, a, a lot of people are saying plus one and it's expensive, so plus one. <laughs> Ufa says plus X on Barrage. And Jay brings up a good point. It's expensive. So helping you guys decide where to spend money makes a lot of sense. Um, and Kurt says, I love your content and want to see your opinions and reviews on as, as many upcoming games as possible, Kickstarter or otherwise. Uh, and Nick says, if you think it's a, a, a heavy game, I would argue midweight and heavy game. Um, we, and we would like it, then go for it. If it doesn't matter if it's pre-release, mid-Kickstarter or retail available. Um, and Adam says, yep, if you think it's a good fit for the show, plus one. I think uh, there are very few that work in the heavy cardboard wheelhouse, Scott says, so I say yes. Um, and Barrage is on Tabletopia as well. That's a good point. Um, and Dennis says it. If it, it's a good match for heavy cardboard, but I think the hot SM releases will be more relevant in the next 12 months. And I agree with that to a point, Dennis, but timeliness on some of these that are, you have a decision to make in the next two weeks. If I have the opportunity to give you guys that information, don't I kind of have a responsibility to help with that? So that kind of makes makes sense to me. And then he, he finishes off by saying still, it's, again, tipping the scale towards, oh, no, more Kickstarter slash sponsored paid 
videos. I get that, but um, let's come back to that. So the fact that they're paid, the amount of time that goes into these games, if they're going to be used for marketing, um, I expect to get paid for my time. You're right, I do. But that's not, I'm not making the decision on whether or not to do sponsor playthroughs or whatnot on whether or not I can get paid or how much I get paid or anything like that. It's, do I think it's a fit for the show or whether do I think it's, and these are very much limited. Do I think these are good stepping stone games? And in the case of Barrage, I think it's, I mean, you've heard. I think it's a perfect example. So I'm getting paid for my time and the amount of work that goes into these, the tens of hours that I'm going to put in to prepare for this playthrough. Um, I think if they're going to be using it for marketing, why shouldn't I? Um, but at the same time, if you're a patron or not, I feel like I'm doing you a service anyway. So isn't it a win-win-win all the way around for you, the viewer, patron or not, me for my time, and also the publisher because they get more, uh, they get the game taught and shown off on what's arguably the best live production in the industry. I think it's a win-win all the way around. All right. So getting back to the chat, uh, let's see. Would love to take uh, another take from a heavy gaming view on Barrage. Uh, Pete says, Darren says, also, I'd like to see a playthrough of Newton. Had two games at Essen, really enjoyed it. Tons to do. Uh, not enough actions. That's going to be coming, Darren. Uh, and Texas CPA says, as long as it doesn't become a rah-rah video every time, like some previewers or reviewers are known to be. Let me ask you, have you ever seen that happen once? Ever? I don't think so. I think my genuine feelings for the game come through as well as those at the table. Um, it's, again, the Pipeline and City of the Big Shoulders. I've been excited about both those games for 18 months to two years. Tale to Walken, I've been uh, legitimately excited about since the beginning of March when I first saw it. So even though those are sponsored playthroughs, it's no secret that those three in particular I'm really looking forward to. Barrage, to be determined. I did get a demo in, and I did really enjoy the demo of it. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm looking forward to playing this some more in an, you know, ahead of doing a, a playthrough of it for you guys. But no, I don't think... I think I've done a pretty good job of genuine feelings and thoughts coming through on the games, okay? Uh, only some Kickstarters should be on, but Barrage is a good choice for the show, Justin says. Uh, and Tony says, I squeezed in a demo at Spiel on Saturday and definitely think the, the herd would like to see this one. Um, did you get a chance to see Ragusa? Uh, I can't remember if I did, Renji. I'm sorry about that. Reynold asks, how was playing against Jeroen at the Food Chain Magnet prototype? Exactly as expected. I got housed, as did Jess. We got crushed, but it was awesome. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, Andrew says, considering the ridiculous amount of expensive and massive Kickstarter projects on right now, a full playthrough would be helpful. All right. And Tim says, wow, the box is beat up, or is that part of the look? No, no. It's very much a... a, a uh, it's just the sticker that got beat up. It's been transported. Um, so the artwork here is, is how it is, but no, the box is just beat up. So no, uh, don't, don't read into that, uh, Tim. Okay, so it seems the general consensus is, yeah, as long as it fits, people... Uh, um, and Justin says, only heavy Kickstarters, if any, otherwise just doing the same thing as Dice Tower and Rado. What exactly do you mean by that, Justin? I'm curious. And Nick says, while I appreciate helping making decisions on a Kickstarter, most of the Kickstarters go to retail, so people on the fence don't have to pledge within the Kickstarter window. That's a fair point, but I would say there is exclusive content to some of these that, and discounted prices, so it does still help them, Nick. Um... Vince says a lot of heavy cardboard type games don't have videos and playthroughs. That's why uh, what you do have value. Having said that, if Barrage already has Man vs. Meeple and Rado videos, refer the herd to those and wait to do a playthrough until after the campaign. If you go back and read on Slack, Vince, you see a lot of people saying they didn't get a real good feel, feel from those. 
um, and they have specifically asked that we do this. So where do I draw the line? And Nick says that the new releases would be better as people might see those in the store and wonder if they should be buying. Jay says, no problem with them being paid as long as you don't shill and you don't shill. You're right, I don't. My integrity is worth more than a few hundred bucks. Appreciate the kind words, Craig says, just popping in to say that I enjoy the show. Keep doing what you all do. And Justin says, the most useful videos are ones of games that other people don't cover. All these small box, light, medium games shown so far will be covered ad nauseum by others. Not sure I agree with that. I don't know that there's a lot of people covering cryptocurrency uh, or, you know, Pax Emancipation obviously is going to fit that, that wheelhouse. Um, 18 Lilliput, um, Symphony Number no. 9, not a lot of playthroughs of Strange Vending Machine, stuff like that. So I'm not sure I entirely agree with that. Tesla Volta says, uh, you, should be be, you should be paid. I agree. Companies should not be coming to you expecting to give them free advertising when it's essentially advertising. It's not advertising because that seems to think that it's promotion. I feel like what it is is informational and trying to help you guys make informed decisions. Uh, Andrea says, I think Kickstarter videos are fine as long as they're curated, which Edward is saying he does. I support the channel because I enjoy the podcast and playthroughs. Uh, and I trust Edward and crew to select. I appreciate that. And I feel like we've earned that, Andrea. So it's glad to, um, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, games that are appropriate for the channel. I feel like I do a pretty good job of that. I may have gotten away from that a little bit in the past. Um, I would argue that earlier this year but or late last year, but I feel like we've gotten back into that really well. And I think the focus is where it needs to be. So, good. <laughs> Todd says, I think Edward and the small council should make the call, not all of the herd, because we'll never all agree. Very, very valid point, Todd. I'm... I'm more or less telling you how this is going to be. It's not me really soliciting. In, uh, I'm asking for your feedback, um, but the decision's kind of already been made that I feel that if it very much falls in the wheelhouse, I think that it's, and it's a good match, that it's something that we're going to do. Um, but I'm, I'm actually, I'm soliciting feedback uh, to be able to take that under advisement. So think of it that way, all right? Uh, Caleb, we have not talked about on Mars yet, uh, but we can a little bit later on. Remind me when, when we move on to that. Um, and Roger Wilco says, like others have said, games that are in the HC wheelhouse are why we're here, Kickstarter or otherwise. Uh, demoing a game that isn't out of print uh, is helpful uh, as well. And Justin says, uh, Tales of the Northland is a good example of heavy cardboard providing great value to a Kickstarter while serving the herd perfectly. Exactly. Perfect. Uh, have not played on Mars yet. I saw the prototype. Um, Vital and Ian asked me not to publish too many pictures of it because it wasn't with Ian's artwork yet. Uh, but uh, you're going to hear more about that through us and Ego Griffin and Ian uh, in the coming months, obviously, because it's VTOL and Ian and Big Box Game and excited about it. So there's that. James says, I want the heavy cardboard uh, play through a barrage. Watching other, uh, don't say that, uh, watching other uh, others uh, play it doesn't do it for me. I appreciate that, but keep it nice, James. They, they are my contemporaries. They are my peers. And in some cases, they are my friends. So um, everybody has their own way of doing things, okay? And Texas CPA says, Justin, I agree regarding Tales of Northland, Saga Zanaga Nanag. Says, if it wasn't for heavy cardboard, I never would have backed it or even knew of it. So, cool. All right. Uh, as long as it doesn't annoy a huge percentage, it's fine to do something that only some people like, Richard says. I appreciate that, Richard. Uh... And Alan says, even if Rado did a run-through instead of a rundown, he did it for Barrage. Uh, the heavy cardboard perspe perspective is always appreciated. Dennis says, all in all, I think heavy cardboard's on the right path. Just concerned a bit that the show could, again, step away from the mid-heavy path. 
Could it happen? Sure, Dennis. Um, but it's very much on the forefront of my mind, and I don't foresee that happening. Um, could it? I suppose. But know that I'm very acutely uh, aware of it. Know that. Okay? And Justin says, uh, for the viewers here, VTOL does open play testing on Tabletopia. Speaking of on Mars, if you want to play on Mars, join his Discord and play a game when he puts a table up. There you go. Cool. So let's go and talk Barrage. I did do a two or three round demo of Barrage along with uh, Jess and another uh, couple from Germany, just random folks. Um, so keep in mind, this is very much uh, uh, prototype both artwork, although the artwork is close to final, I was able to give some graphic design input on uh, some of the things on the board that absolutely, in my opinion, were important to get addressed. And the designer, Tomas, or one of the designers, um, was very receptive to that, so that's good. So you have the main wheel for actually turns uh, clockwise for spending resources to be able to construct um, uh, infrastructure uh, for the dams and so on and so forth because it's uh, all about hydroelectric power. And as I mentioned, we were fortunate enough to get uh, the expansion included in this. Again, it's all prototype stuff, so I'm not going to go over it in depth too much right now, but we have, uh, it's a mix of wooden and plastic pieces. All this is to be determined in the Kickstarter. You can always go to that to see more on that. More components, more components, and this is part of the expansion. We are going to be playing with the expansion when we do the uh, when we do the uh, live stream. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not part of the expansion. This is the advanced game stuff. I'm sorry. Uh, this, let me see. Those are base game, base game player boards here, and. Those are not the expansion stuff. It's in here somewhere. I apologize. It may have gotten moved to a different box, but it's definitely in here. Or, nope, there it is. Some of the expansion. Oh, come on. There we go. Some of the expansion stuff. Okay. And, again, some of this is a... Uh, Another uh, faction, this is just on paper. Again, it's prototype components, so understand that. But these are going to be uh, some of the expansion tiles that are going to go onto these boards, like so, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So more on that uh, when we do the playthrough. So there, there. And I'll briefly show you guys the board. And the board is uh, on thin paper as well, again, prototype, but there we go. And I'm sure you guys have seen this already on the Kickstarter or whatnot, but hydroelectric power. So you have four different uh, uh, lakes that are going to be coming down and room for infrastructure. And it's all about uh, building dams and control towers uh, into the hydroelectric uh, power plants to be able to, as water flows downhill, et cetera, et cetera, with the Victory Point track. Uh, so it's a bit resource conversion, worker placement, good mix of stuff. Really enjoyed our playthrough of this, our demo, I should say, of this. And yeah, you guys are going to be seeing a whole lot about this, uh, or at least a playthrough of it, in the next couple of weeks before the Kickstarter ends. So there we go. That is Barrage. Cool. And this is some of the worker placement stuff. So one of the graphic design suggestions that Tomas was very receptive of is, and I want to zoom in on this to show you guys, and he said, yeah, we have time to address this, is these areas just cost workers, but you see these that are outlined, outlined in red, but this one is not right here. This one's not, but these are. Uh, these cost an extra three coins, but it's actually really hard to see. It's really faint. So I suggested them making this bold and making the outline stand out far more. And the costing three coins isn't mentioned anywhere on any of the boards. So suggested that on the player aid, they have that. And last but not least, all these 
Uh, the connection lines for the water, the pipes, are color-coded, so all the threes here are yellow, all the oranges are four, all the reds are five value, but that's not listed anywhere either, so I suggested that those be included either on the board somewhere or also on the player aid, so there's that. So there you go, so Barrage. Uh, really enjoyed the demo. Again, it was only a couple of rounds. I did terrible, just killed all four of us, or the, the, uh, the three of us in this, and yeah, looking forward to doing a playthrough of it, even though I got utterly eviscerated in that. Okay? Cool. Um, Dennis says, okay, the last part of the rant, I love you, Dennis, says, I'm just afraid that we will watch Heavy Cardboard, see all the fun you guys are having, and buy him back another game. <laughs> That's awesome. Good stuff. Uh... All right, and Mom Gamer says, thank you, Heavy Cardboard. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Mom. Uh, all right. Cool. And James says, uh, there's room for all kinds of games. I don't want to play heavy games every time I play. I prefer medium heavy stuff, but some days I just want something short and fun. So cool. Appreciate it, James. As long as you don't feel you can, can't offer negative or neutral opinions during the Kickstarter playthrough, I'm good with mid-heavy to heavy Kickstarter games being played. No, Drew, nobody, nobody has the right to dictate that to us, and I don't offer them that option. We have taken out the roundtable discussions as that starts to get into opinion too much, and I'm not comfortable with that, with the exception of Pipeline and City of the Big Shoulders, because I've helped with those games a little bit along the way and it's no no secret that I'm a really big fan of both those so that makes sense but yeah um, I think I think we're pretty good at, at walking that line uh, hey Dave, banker Dave says glad you two made it back across the Atlantic safely thank you and Mashimi says greetings from uh, Germany awesome thanks all right I have a half hour to go and we have a lot more games so Let's talk about the other game. Oh, one other thing, real quick. So, the Kingdom uh, Defenders. I told you I had to go get the English rule book. So, there we go. And they had these on Saturday. So, I actually picked them up on Sunday. So, that will go into that box. There. The other game that I was uh, regarding a sponsored playthrough that's on Kickstarter now that I had talked to the guys about. Here's the thing. This game wasn't even on my list at all at Essen. And this is entirely the fault of a patron. So Tudor, uh, we uh, ran into a few times uh, at Essen. He was playing Ceylon and saw him there. And he actually tweeted at me to go check out this game. He thinks it would be an awesome fit for the show. And keep in mind, Tudor focuses a lot on 18xx games. That's what he really enjoys. But he also plays mid and heavy Euros. So I was like, funny you mentioned that. I just walked by their booth. I'm there right now. So I talked to the folks there. And yeah, I think this is a really good match. Um, a game that I wasn't at all, wasn't on my radar. So blame Tudor on this one. Tudor, seriously, thank you for that. So Chartered, The Golden Age by Jolly Dutch. Uh, two to six players plays 60 to 90 minutes, okay? So, here we go. Um, so, this is, I think I had a, literally a four-minute overview of the game, but the game, the rule book is not that big. It is not super, super heavy. Um, the rule book here, there, and there. So, not a super heavy game, but the, the best way I can describe it is a, a modern take on an interpretation of a choir. So economic game that is player-driven investment. And all of the players are going to be investing in these different companies here. And what they are is merely a, uh, a name or an aesthetic. They're not asymmetric. And we're going to be investing and in building up the board and investing in what we invest in merging companies, et cetera, et cetera, to increase our portfolios uh, and have the most lucrative portfolio and cash on hand by the end of the game. 
And the board, again, this is a prototype, but wow, is this a nice prototype. So it's a pretty big board, and based on the number of players, it has a couple different sides to it. So you can see how uh, the value uh, or the cards that will match up with the different spaces here on the board. You're going to be building these companies, physically building them up and investing in shares and uh, building those and eventually, hopefully merging them in the merging order that you want that is most beneficial to you. So think midweight economic game that I think is going to be a really, really good match. And big shout out to Tudor for turning me on to this. And I think, I think he did well. I think it's going to be a really good match. Nice player aids. I mean, this is a prototype, guys. This is ridiculous. Prototypes have come a long way. Um, so there we go. But yeah, so looking forward to showing you guys this in the next couple of weeks as well. All right, so different cards. There are some events that affect everybody equally around the board or around the table. And there we go. So that is Chartered, the Golden Age. Looking forward to that. All right. Uh, it's a remake, Pete says, of an old Kinesia game. Um, okay. So there we go. Okay, so somewhat like Stevenson's Rocket. Okay, all right. Good to know. Good. And Renji says, I really like Chartered, uh, was on the fence for it as well. Have I played Kashgar yet? I played the original uh, with the with um, uh, paste ups, really enjoyed it. I haven't gotten a English version of it. I know it got reprinted. Uh, no, I haven't gotten a copy of it yet though, no. All right, so that is Chartered, okay. So let's see, let's go lighter here. Santa Maria finally picked up a copy. We've already done a playthrough of this, um, but the reason I picked up a copy of this is Porta Games. Um, there you go. It's punched. It's it's Santa Maria. This isn't new, but what is new is the expansion. The expansion is packed up in one of the boxes, and that'll be coming. Um, will we feature it on the show or talk about it on the podcast? Probably eventually. Um, but yeah, so there you go, Santa Maria. Cool. All right. Uh, let's also go some of... So something that oh, uh, I was offered to do a playthrough of, but I did not think would show really well because technologically I didn't know if I could do it. And the app will be ready for this, I want to say, uh, the end of this year. So I can't play this until then, but you boot. Real-time, app-driven, tabletop submarine simulator. It's a co-op. I don't like co-ops, but this game was too badass to not take a look at. From Phalanx Games, 60-plus uh, minute uh, plays. I want to say it was one to, yeah, it's one to four players. So if you guys have been to any of the major conventions since, oh, I don't know, Gen Con last year, maybe Essen last year, they have had a prototype of this that looked amazing. It's a 3D submarine, and it has an app in real time. Uh, the game works to where everybody has different jobs within the U-boat. And yeah, this was, you know, just badass. I want to be the navigator, I'll be honest, in this with the charts and everything, the way this works. Just looked like an awesome game, and I've been excited about this for a while. So you have navigation charts that you're going to be marking on here. Um, a ton of different chits. You have, when you build the submarine itself, the U-boat, you actually put some of the, uh, the uh, I forget what size guns these are, and antennas on them. You have different player boards, as well as various different uh, spots on the board for different uh, things that can happen Hence with the cards. The different crew here happen to your crew. Um, if a tactical guide, which is pretty in depth and a huge rule book, but I believe this is going to be in different. Nope. Nope, not in different languages. This is just uh, just in English, and that is a really big rule book. So look for this at some point if I can figure out how to stream this with the app. I really want to be able to do that because I think this is badass. And probably the coolest 
uh, adaptation of app meets board game uh, in existence. So you can see some of the navigation stuff that you're going to be doing here. And this is a tactical guide that helps you on how to play and what to do. Um, war game meets co-op meets heavy cardboard. Um, just, yeah, awesome. And the different components of the U-boat itself here, because it's a 3D U-boat, to give you an idea there. Um, yeah, so it just looked really, really badass. So I just hope we're able to figure out a way to stream this. If not, you're going to hear about it on the podcast, but I hope that I'll be able to figure out a way between, you know, in the next couple of months to be able to show this off to you guys, because... I'm pretty excited about it. And you're talking to somebody who really does not enjoy co-ops. So, yeah, there you go. Now for something a little bit different, yeah? So, U-Boat, or U-Boot from, uh, from Phalanx Games. All right, cool. Oh, okay. And Space Monkey says, hey, Matias says, strange how things fall sometimes. Super interested in World War II stuff, books, games, etc., but no interest in U-Boot. And then Chisholm says, super excited for this one. So there's that. Uh, all right. The game that we picked up from Quinta Games, uh, Raetia, I think, maybe, is how... Uh, that is the Kickstarter one, a uh, 3D ship thing. Yes, that is, Jeff. Um, yep, okay. This is has a ton of stuff in it. Uh, so this looked interesting enough to pick it up from Quinted. Uh, Paul over there said that this is their heaviest game uh, this year and, and uh, wanted us to have a copy to check it out. So there we go. So glass beads here. Um, little clips which I thought was pretty interesting, right? Like page marker clips, so I'm not sure how those are used. That'll be interesting. Uh, wooden bits, more stuff that got punched, uh, more kind of like plastic painted half domes, or, or, uh, gla or uh, plastic pieces here as well, and some of the tiles and board in rule book down there. So there we go, okay? All right, cool. Ah, uh, let's see. And... Uh, Steam Pirates. I have no idea if we're going to like this or not from Golden Egg. And this is the one game that got banged up, really, box-wise. So, apologize on that. But if that's the worst thing that happens, that's all right. Um, so, yeah, Steam Pirates. No idea. But we have more nesting here. All right, so inside, so we have the board for Steam Pirates, which, eh, we'll see. I don't know. We'll see. All right, so more Steam Pirates stuff there and the rule book. I don't know. Not every game is going to be a winner. Could it be? It absolutely could be. Will it be? I don't know. Um, we also have Radetzky uh, from Postscriptum and Placentia Games as well, which... I'll be, this is another co-op, but I'll be honest, I will never play this on a live stream unless I play it as a solo game, which it is soloable. It's one to five, and it plays in 45 to 90 minutes, but as a solo game, I thought this might sound kind of interesting. The history behind it, uh, the uprising that went on there in Milan uh, in 1848, and inside Rodensky is also Master of Respect from Hobby Japan. So I had a meeting with the head of Hobby Japan there, and he was excited. Uh, he talked to me about uh, them going to the Tokyo Game Fair and finding a game or two or three each year that might not be the number one or number two game out of that, but that were good games but needed further development. And Master of Respect is one of those games that they developed further from uh, a game, the game that it was at the Tokyo Game Fair, and this is it, and he thought this would be a good match for the show as well. Again, I mean, it's three to five players, 45 to 60 minutes, so not a super heavy, not a super thinky, not a long game, but maybe filling that thinky 
uh, filler niche, plus, again, somewhat a little bit obscure. So I thought this would be a good one as well. And it's a mix of all three games that are in here. It's Steam Pirates, it's Radetzky, and it's Master of Respect. So I apologize, but again, I wanted to show this off to you guys a little bit to show for those that are interested in doing some of this stuff going forward and how we transport games back to make it a little bit more economical. So you can see, obviously, this is Steam Pirate. Uh, and then we have some of the tiles of Master of Respect, the back side of those, and the front side. All right. And then some of the cards for Radetzky here as well. So there you go. I uh, don't want to really drag all of this out because this is going to make a huge mess and I'm up against the clock a little bit and I definitely want to spend some time on some other stuff as well. So there we go. So that's three in one. So we have Master of Respect, which fit inside Radetzky, which then fit inside Steam Pirates. And there we go. Oop, yep, that's the one casualty of the trip. All right, all things told, not too bad. Oh, awesome. And uh, Matias says, I love being at Spiel for three days and still seeing new things. Never even heard of this one. This one being which one? Master of Respect or which one, Matias? <laughs> Scott, Spiel 18, the Thinky Filler Convention. Don't think of it that way, and here's why. Because of the fact that these are games that we could take home with us that could nest. Because the other ones we didn't, uh, we didn't punch and didn't do all those things with. And so a lot of the big, big box games are going to be coming later. So don't think that, Nick, or uh, Scott, okay? All right? Cool. Editor. For a moment, I thought, holy cow, that's a lot of components for a single game. Yeah, right? Uh, okay, Alessandro. I played Master of Respect twice and liked it. It's basically a resource management game with a secret action programming. Ooh. All right. So, Smartphone Inc. from Cosmodrome Games. One of my more anticipated games when I heard about it uh, for Essen, and we were able to secure a copy. Um, big thanks to Jess on the help with that. One to five players plays in about 90 minutes. So um, for uh, those that don't want to use calculators, here we go. So one of the different, uh, different companies that you can be, SunTech, Redberry, etc. And this, this entire game is chock full of components. It is an extraordinarily heavy box. Rules and corrections for smartphone and the Steve solo mode. So just a little bit of uh, uh, rules uh, uh, corrections here. And this was a bit of a hard game. Once you punch it to fit everything back in, Steve being the solo version of the game here and the changes in that. And here's the rule book. That's a pretty good uh, view of what the board looks like as well. And it's a dual layer board. So you can see here, like the yellow and the blue, that's countersunk. So it is a dual layer board like that. And that also contributes to why the uh, this box is so extraordinarily heavy for its size. FAQs. And there we go. All right, so, but yeah, the, oh, so this board, I'm not going to break this out, but this is super thick and I'm hoping you guys can see that it's double layered. Yeah, there you go. You can see the indentions here and there and all that. So I appreciate the quality and the punch boards are all super, super thick as well. And I wanted to show you guys this as well. So the boxes for the different companies. So you have these that fit in there and then smart, these are plastic and it shows different compartments for the various cube colors that here. So this is why 
all this took one, one whole box and we didn't, uh, we didn't adjust this at all. I didn't try and nest because it was completely chock full. So there we go, all right? So to give you an idea, so definitely going to look uh, for this one, um, quite possibly as a review and playthrough uh, going forward. So we'll see. So Smartphone Inc. I know it was on a lot of people's radars. Okay. Todd, I'm out on this one as I hate, uh, as I hate uh, smartphones. Nick says, I was excited for Smartphone Inc., but the look of the game in the Rado video left me cold. I'll be honest, the look of it for me was eh as well. So we'll see on that. Um, yeah. We'll see. Um, I don't know. All right. What's the game like? No idea, Shazner. Couldn't, couldn't tell you that. So this is another prototype that we got. Uh, this game was on my undecided list uh, when I saw it. So it's called Imnia. This is from, I forget the name of the publisher, I apologize. They are from Romania. And this was kind of a Civ building. I spoke about this pretty in depth a little bit on the Daily Diary. I forget which night, but it's kind of like a faux leather box. It's, it's totally a prototype, so keep that in mind. But like a felt lining on the inside. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what to think on this. Um, no promises were made, no nothing, but they were like, yeah, we would love for you guys to take a look at it. And it's a Tableau engine builder where the goal of the game is to, uh, build one of these five, um, wonders. So King of the Seven Seas, so that big ship, Tomb of the Immortal King, Halls of Wisdom, uh, Abundance Road or Monument of Faith. So that it, and they said that it takes anywhere from 45 to 60 minutes per player, and it plays. I believe it was two to four, two to five players. Um, so it's it's definitely weight wise, time wise, pretty pretty heavy, and it's a resource conversion engine builder with a little bit of take that if you want to include that. And you're going to be building, uh, card drafting, and building up your tableau in which 10 of the 15 cards that you're going to have in your tableau are going to be essential of choosing which of the wonders to go towards. And it's an efficiency game as well. So it sounded kind of interesting. So I said, yeah, we'll take a look at it and we'll see. And uh, definitely a tiny little publisher. Uh, and I apologize for not knowing the publisher's name. I feel bad about that. But yeah, uh, it's got custom wooden meeples in the prototype as well. The cards all look decent for a prototype. And it's definitely uh, looks like a, a homemade but well-produced prototype. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. And they even have, it's coming to Kickstarter, I think, down the road. Um, but yeah, they wanted us to take a look at it and see. So Imnia. All right. So I am N-I-A. Take a look at it, um, and we'll see how much coverage we give it as, as we go along, okay? Cool. Uh, all right, so the last four things, five things that I want to go over. So, Bernd Eisenstein, latest game, Pandoria. He of, oh, and this was funny, so I, I ran into Bern at, the, uh, at his booth, and I could not remember, just like I'm struggling, uh, uh, Golly, I can't remember the other game that we covered. We did a live stream and did a full uh, review on from two years ago. And I could not remember the name, just like now. Uh, anyway, Bernd Eisenstein's game, Pandoria, was curious to see... Oh, hold on. Was curious to see on this one, get clothes that I actually used to fill space, because this one was too thin to nest stuff. So this is Pandoria, and this has a ton of components. So punched all of this. More custom wooden meeples here. Cards. The rule book in multiple languages. It looked good, looked interesting. Uh, player tableau, and then an idea of what the board itself looks like, okay? 
Plexi Interactive. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. Cool. All right. So we have two more games and a couple other little things that I wanted to show off that were really, really important to me. All right. So the penultimate game of this haul is one that I was unsure about until I saw and read up on it. And then once I read up on it, I was like, yeah. And this is actually from MD, but uh, uh, Japan Brand Games are the ones who brought it over. And that is Forwarder of Xanadu. So three to five players, plays in roughly two minutes, thereabouts. Um, the art style, not my favorite. I'm not a huge manga guy, uh, I think, is, and all of this is in Japanese on the back. But good news, the rule book is in English, I'm pretty sure. So we punch this. Hopefully this one's empty. Yep, all right, so here we go. So, I mean, Elephant Express, yeah. Uh, so it has one Japanese side and... English side on the others. So you have a whole bunch of these tiles. Terminal Block 1, Firefly Alley. So this is another one that I'm really, really excited about and I hope good things about it. But I mean, we'll see, right? So a bunch of the punch components, all wooden. All those are. Oh, did I did I say plays? No, plays in 120 minutes. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Two hours. There we go. A couple hours, not minutes. Sorry. Uh, decks of cards. Otam port. And the rule book. And I'm pre yeah, it's in English. So here's the manual. Big font, big pictures, so we'll see. To be determined, obviously, but sounded interesting. There we go, all right. Oop. There we go. That's Forwarder of Xanadu. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Hold on, a drink? What do we got? We got five minutes, gotta hurry. I'm saving what, for me, is the best for last. I got two things. You ready? So here's the box from Pat Piper. Um, yeah, so I actually intentionally left it in this box to show you guys how good this is packaged. This is genius. This was arguably became the number one most anticipated game I had out of Essen. Okay? So the box itself is in there, and it has... Well, there's more in there that you might be able to see, but they're corner protectors like this for the box. It's that attention detail that I really appreciated to make sure that the box stays in really, really good shape. And if you listen to the SM preview, you would have heard me talk about Crossroads of Heroes. I would argue that it's probably the best looking game that I saw at Essen and... Uh, just looked amazing and everybody that I heard that demoed this had nothing but good things to say about it. Um, I'll show the inside of the lid here in a minute. The board. Rule book. Just really well put together production of this, and I want to show you guys the cards as well. So, ah, come on, come on, come on, come on. all right, some of the stuff that needs to get punched, but let me show you guys some of the cards here. I just, I just really thought that this was absolutely gorgeous. Um, and the look on this, just really good stuff. 
and super excited about it. I never really was a huge uh, into Japanese artwork. Um, I, I didn't realize until uh, until uh, a handful of these games have come out. So yeah, there we go. All right. Um, yeah. So from uh, Peter Piper or Pat Piper, sorry. Uh, it's a Wuxia themed strategy board game, is what it says. Um, yeah, I'm super stoked about this game, and that's that doesn't happen terribly often uh, that I get really really excited about games. But the artwork absolutely drew me in. The production value of this drew me in, and I'm looking forward to it. So hopefully, uh, hopefully Pat uh, put together a good game. All right. So, and this was a nice touch. So Pat signed it, and then uh, they, uh, one of the ladies at the booth um, also signed it, and I appreciated that and stamped it. it yeah, just gorgeous production. It's, it's little stuff like this that made it, that matters to, to me. So let's hope it's a good game now, right? <laughs> so there we go. Crossroads of Heroes. I talked about this the last couple days of the con, and uh, they sold out. So hopefully we did some good. With that, uh, two to five players plays an hour to an hour and a half. Okay? So, Crossroads of Heroes. There we go. Um, cool. All right. Uh, so, that's it, game-wise. But let me tell you all a story, brief story. If you guys had watched the Brides and Bribes playthrough, um, you know that, uh, that Rita, Rita was not very kind to any of us in that game. And there are more glory to Rome's in that live stream than have ever been in, hi in the history of the show. There were a dozen glory to Rome's, or as we like to call it then, uh, glory to Rita's. And so Eliza, one of the three designers of the game, along with Pietro and Andre, uh, she, had, she had sent me some pictures of a joke, like promo that they were, they, that she made in response to that. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. And we saw them on Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday. I think it was Wednesday at the hall, uh, Space Balloon Games. And they were like, do you have a minute? Can you come by the booth? And so we came by the booth. And yeah, Chinese, not Japanese. I apologize. Thank you uh, for Crossroads of Heroes. Um, and they handed me a, a, a Ziploc bag here of this. And they made this. And yes, it's a real, I mean, it's a tile. It's a promo they made. Um, so the special abilities on this are, I get plus three if I marry anyone, but I'm never allowed to marry Rita. And yeah, that was, that, that was amazing. So that was one of the coolest things that I've ever seen. And they were super appreciative of the playthrough. I was super appreciative of the game, and stuff like this was uh, uh, pretty amazing and hysterical. So a massive shout out and massive thank you to the folks at uh, Eliza, Pietro, and Andre at Space Balloon Games. And they also made some stickers of that, that if anybody out there wants them, we might could figure out something. And I do have a handful of those promos to give away as well. And this is arguably one of the greatest things I've ever seen. So, <laughs> yeah, so that was awesome. Um, so, yeah, that, that made me tear up, as I want to do, apparently. Uh, yeah. So, there's that, all right? Um, all right, so Rita goes back onto there, where she belongs. That's Brides and Bribes. Um, the last thing, last thing I wanted to show you guys, and I'll switch back to the other camera here real quick for this, is something that uh, Jess and I picked up uh, by the Eiffel Tower when we were in Paris. It's super touristy, I know, whatever. But thought this was pretty cool and wanted to show you guys this. So this is going to go up as a decoration somewhere here in the studio at some point. So it's an elephant that turns into... The Eiffel Tower, and thought that was that was kind of cool. So yeah, so there you go. Little uh, hand drawing, sketching of uh, of that, and thought that was really really nice. So there you go. Cool. So yeah, uh, bought that for a few uh, few euros 
uh, there you go. Um, also, somebody had asked in Slack about uh, the Asher card in Reckle. Come to find out, Asher, the herd in Greyhound, is in the base game itself. And, uh, and yeah, so I have my dog immortalized in a board game, which if you watch The Last Last the Elephant, you, yeah, I'm not going to go into it. So, yeah, he is in the base game. So, again, a big thank you to Matthias over at Frosted Games for surprising me with that. I had no idea. That was really meaningful and really thoughtful and... Yeah, it just means a lot, so thanks. Um, there we go. Cool. Uh, there we go. That's all I got. So that is everything that we were able to mule back game-wise from Essen. There are still another 74 kilos worth of games that are coming, and I'll do more of these as the games arrive sometime in the next 4 to 14 days, is my guess. Uh, live streams will start back up on... Sunday with the weekly look ahead, and I'll, we'll know together what, what games are coming. And the podcast will start up soon after that. And don't forget, like, subscribe, it helps. If you want to become a patron and join the 747 of them out there, go to pledgehc.com. Certainly helps the show. Certainly helps me. I really appreciate it. Um, what else? Yeah. Oh, and listen to the podcast over on heavycardboard.com and the supplemental, Heavy Cardboard supplemental feed. Two feeds. One for the main podcast, one for the daily diaries, so on and so forth. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out, uh, spending a couple hours with me. And hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys are excited about some of these games as I am. Some of these, eh, we'll see. Some of these, yeah, pretty stoked. And I guarantee there's going to be at least one of these that we're like, eh, on, or thought we were, that come to be really good games. At least one, and I'm sure there's more going the other way. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the week, and I'll touch base with you guys on Sunday. Take care, everybody.